Yeah, hello everyone and welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Martin Jäger and I'm from uh, LibreSolar, which is a project and as well a small company and we uh, develop open source hardware for renewable energy systems, especially tiny solar systems. And we also do some contracting work for uh, Zephyr related stuff, um, ideally also in the renewable energy sector. And uh, yeah, today I will talk about a project that is not directly related to solar, but um, it's something we developed uh, yeah, during the past years uh, in different projects, and it's called ThinkSet, which is kind of a protocol uh, that is transport agnostic and can be used for many purposes. And uh, yeah, we found it to be very useful in our projects, and uh, hopefully you can find it useful in your projects as well. So um, let's have a look at a uh, yeah, diagram with typical data flows you have in an embedded device. So if we look at the um, device in the center, you have your MCU with your RAM inside, and you often have uh, yeah, some kind of uh, persistent memory, like either a flash or an EEPROM or both, uh, where you store your settings. And um, yeah. Many devices have some kind of sensor uh, as an input and actuators as an output where they communicate with, which uh, would be simple protocols like SPI or um, uh, I2C. squared But we also usually have uh, lots of more communication interfaces for our devices. For example, it could be a mobile app uh, communicating via Bluetooth uh, some kind of cloud connection uh, via MQTT, WebSockets, uh, or CoAP, for example. Um, yeah, and these are all the communication interfaces that are kind of relevant to the user of the app. But also as a developer, uh, we need some other means for communication with the uh, device. Uh, usually during development, we need some logging. Uh, that's uh, unidirectional in this picture, so it's just eight output information but often we also need to interact with the device during testing and go into some test settings, um, yeah, uh, tune some set points. So that would be a bidirectional interface uh, where you can, for example, use the Zephyr shell. Um, yeah, so that would be a serial interface as well as the, the uh, log data interface. And uh, looking from the manufacturer's perspective, uh, also they have to, um, yeah, if during end of line testing somehow um, put data into the device, for example, for provisioning of keys, for uh, calibration of sensors, um, yeah, end of line testing, and so on. And all these different interfaces usually use completely different protocols. And there are solutions for all of them, um, but uh, what if we could use exactly the same protocol and the same data for all of these interfaces? And that's exactly what the ThinkSet project is about, and I'm going to tell you about the, yeah, how it works and uh, um, yeah, how you can use it for your projects. Uh, first of all, it's all open source, so you can uh, download all the software and the app that I'm going to show at the end, uh, which is written in Flutter. Uh, the software is all in C and Zephyr based, of course. Um, yeah, so that's the, um, the the points I will try to cover in the presentation. The first step uh, in order to make the data useful is uh, to have a very defined structure of the data. We call it a semantic data model. Uh, then we have the protocol that uh, allows to access this data. Uh, it's kind of a query language you will see later on, but a very simple one. Um, yeah, then we have the different transports, because I said it's transport agnostic, so there must be at least a few transports it can be used with. And some mappings, which are protocols where it can be integrated, but which do not fit for all features uh, of the ThinkSet protocol. Yeah, at the end I will show uh, how it's all integrated with Zephyr and which features we leveraged and uh, show it in a demo where we uh, develop a small sensor that's uh, connected to an app and the app will display useful data. Okay, um, yeah, I wanted to come up with some sort of example application, uh, so I thought uh, a smart thermostat could be something useful because we have a simple sensor, like a temperature sensor, um, an actuator, and uh, yeah, we need to set some target values. I didn't find any picture that was vendor neutral, so they all had logos on them. So I asked a stable diffusion for a thermostat in Prague at sunset. That's what came out. 
So uh, that's what we're going to develop now. Um, and take as an example, because examples are usually better to understand the concepts behind it. So uh, yeah, we have measured temperature as an input, a target temperature as an input as well by the user, so that should be configurable by an app. And uh, the output is uh, whether the heater is on or off. Now let's go directly to the data model. So um, this is um, yeah, displayed as a JSON structure, and uh, JSON is actually one of the formats we use for the transport, but we can also use CoAP for uh, more constrained devices, and then uh, yeah, you send, a binary, send binary data, and you can even use IDs instead of the names here. Um, there are a few terms to clarify. Um, so one is a data object, that's all of these single lines, basically. Uh, and then we have uh, basically th four types of data objects. One is the data item, that's uh, actually useful data, so the, the data like a measurement value, or in this case, if, if you look at the first line, it's the node ID, so that's a string, and that's a leaf node of the tree-like structure you see. Uh, then a group is uh, something to gather some useful data into one group, as the name suggests, like we can use it for sensor data or for control data, so it's just to, to have a, a better structure of the whole thing. Um, then we have something that's called subsets, and subsets are used to reference existing data in the structure so that you can uh, use only a subset of the whole data uh, to generate reports, regular reports that you want to send out to the cloud or via your app. And they are uh, basically links to the path inside the uh, structure. So if we look at this uh, subset here, the sensor room temperature in degree C is this path, so here and then the slash and then this item. And an overlay uh, is kind of similar to the Zephyr device tree overlays. It has a slightly different meaning. It's, um, it can hold some metadata that's not necessary for the um, most important understanding of the data, but still sometimes you can't con encode everything into just one single string, uh, what you need about the data. So uh, that can be put on top of the whole structure of the data. And uh, in our case, it is used uh, for um, configuring the reporting of these uh, subsets of data. So you would then uh, create an overlay with the prefix of an underscore, and then you have the same name as you have in the original data structure above, and then you can configure how this uh, subset should be reported. We will see that later on, and then it will uh, get more clear. Now, as you have already seen, uh, some of those data objects have uh, prefixes and some do not have prefixes. So the, the groups uh, don't have prefixes and all these naming conventions are really uh, important for the whole model to work and to generate the app out of it at the end. And uh, so that's, it's just a convention that uh, yeah, if you stick to it, you will uh, generate a nice user interface and also the idea is that uh, if you have a device and you don't know anything about it, then you can find out what data ex it exposes and most importantly, like what unit is the temperature in, for example. So sometimes you see APIs where uh, there is just temperature and then you think, well, is it Fahrenheit, is it degree C? Um, yeah, and that uh, should all be part of the data. Um, yeah, the, the main objectives of this data model is um, that it's schema-less and self-explanatory. So uh, the ideal case would really be that in 20, 30 years, uh, if that uh, simple protocol that can be used for this, uh, uh, for things that uh, is still uh, yeah, useful, then you can connect to the device, find out the data from the device. You don't need any manual or anything, like in Modbus, for example, where you need a, a huge catalog of uh, register uh, numbers. Um, yeah. That's the, probably the most important objective, and it should be easy to use and human readable. That's why uh, one mode is in JSON. And there's a second mode, uh, I already briefly touched that, that has a more compact footprint, and that uses CBOR and uh, numeric IDs optionally instead of the uh, string names here. So it can be really used for LoRaWAN, for example. That's one of our use cases where you have uh, yeah, like tens of bytes uh, per message. 
and you really don't want to s send strings uh, in each message. Same for CAN bus, that's also one of our main applications. Uh, you would use the uh, binary ID and then just send the payload uh, value via CBOR. Uh, quickly touching uh, on these prefixes, so our data items, um, the, they have, uh, for example, this P prefix, which means it's a protected item that can usually not be changed by the user. An R prefix is a read-only value, so that's suitable for measurement values, uh, because you want, don't want to change them. Um, and an S is a stored value, that means it's stored in non-volatile memory, so our target set point of the thermostat should be stored even if the device runs out of battery and has to be restarted. And there's also a W for written values that are stored in RAM only. They can be used for control loops where you don't want to write to the EEPROM or flash memory every time and uh, wear it off quite quickly. So the, here's an overview again about the different prefixes. We didn't cover constant, so constant are not changing, so uh, if a backend received a constant value, it can expect that it stays the same all the time, so it only stores it once, and not in a time series database, for example, and read-only values are changing values like measurements. Um, then we have a T prefix for timestamps, because they are special and sometimes uh, yeah, sent in every message, so it should be really short and executable items uh, which call a function internally in the C code. For the subsets, we also have different prefixes to categorize them. That's mainly for backends so that they understand if this is changing data or is it, is it static data that's uh, just sent to the device usually. And the groups and the overlays don't have any prefix, so you can distinguish them from uh, normal data items. Now coming to the access protocol. So if we think of this JSON st structure as something like a database that we have in RAM in our device, we somehow want to access these uh, single items. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have two ways to do this. One is a request response model, and the other one is uh, that you send out regular reports but don't expect a response. Uh, that's usual, useful for the measurement data and also for Canvas, you would just send it to the bus and don't flood the bus uh, with all the ACK uh, packages. Uh, yeah, and the last one is a desire that would be a message that's sent to the device, uh, but you don't expect a response either because uh, yeah, the device will just try to receive the package and uh, pass it and use it, and if it can't use it, it will be silently ignored. Or, for example, if there are data items it doesn't understand, it would ignore them. Now, uh, the protocol is really pretty simple. Here's the basic layout, um, the message layout. It's, uh, yeah, it's just a stream of bytes, starting with the first byte, which dis distinguishes uh, what type of message we have. So this is just the first byte and it can be either a text uh, byte like the question mark and the question mark would be a GET request, an equivalent of a GET request in HTTP or a co-op. In binary it would be the 0, 1 which is actually the same as the co-op GET request. Um, then we have a few other uh, request response functions. The um, equal sign is uh, to update data, uh, plus is to create new data, um, data items, delete is to delete something from like an array, for example, and the exclamation mark is an executable item. Responses always use the colon uh, and an additional response code, and the response code is uh, mapped to CBOR and HTTP response codes, so that it can be easily integrated with web environments and so on. Okay, let's have a look at some examples of the protocol itself. We have the same data structure again at the left, and uh, now we want to retrieve all the sensor values. So we would send this command to the device, so it's the question mark, and then sensor is the path, uh, and in this case it's not uh, nested, it's, so it's uh, on the highest level of the hierarchy, and uh, then we will just get back all the JSON that's behind it. And that's exactly how the protocol works. It takes the values from RAM, uh, puts them, serializes them into the JSON structure and sends them out. The 85 is the response code for um, yeah, values with content. It's the 200 in HTTP, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, and we have uh, an update request here. So we want to update the target temperature. And this is a stored value and not a read-only value. And uh, so we use the equal sign and the control path and then provide the yeah, only the data items we want to update in that uh, group. And uh, we get 84 as response code, which is, uh, it has been successfully updated. And of course, there are also error responses, which tell you our uh, data object not found and things like that. Um, yeah, and last uh, request response example is to delete uh, the humidity sensor values from the live metrics subject, uh, subset, uh, which would take, so the M live is this live metric subset and it has been this before and this command would delete that sensor out of the list and then it would not be sent out anymore. Um, then we have this uh, other communication pattern, the, uh, it's more published subscribe-like um, report and desire. And that can, and by the way, also be, uh, it's more suitable for asynchronous uh, communication. So if you have a server backend and uh, you have some yeah, devices that are not connected regularly, you would place the desire in the back end and then the device connects, gets the desire and applies it to its own data. And uh, likewise, in the other direction, a device can connect to the cloud, uh, then send out the report and then disconnect. So here's an example of a report. It also starts with one character. In this uh, case, it's the hash sign. Then it has uh, the sender path again and the JSON structure that's behind this sender path. So that can be used for, uh, for a group or you can use it for the um, subset, in this case the live metrics subset. Uh, so this would be the path and then we don't put this error array anymore but the actual values that uh, are behind these links. And then last uh, but not least, the um, yeah, a desire to change the control um, target temperature, and uh, yeah, in this case, uh, we would not get a response as we got previously with the request response mes messaging pattern. Um, yeah, the the whole thing can be used over lots of different transport protocols, as I mentioned already, and this is an example of a possible networking topology. Uh, so um, you could either directly connect to a device for example, via Bluetooth or via CAN. So that would be an, a desktop application or a mobile app uh, getting directly onto the device which has Bluetooth and exposes data via things set. Or you could also have a, a backend in between and then you could communicate via IP networks, for example. And um, yeah, the backend could forward requests from a web front end or an app as well uh, to the devices that are connected behind the backends, or you could also have multiple devices or even legacy devices uh, which would, uh, for example, transfer Modbus uh, registers into the ThingSet protocol to make the data more useful than just register names, but then you have to put the manual information into that gateway. Um, yeah, so um, most of these things uh, are already working, uh, but I found it would be most interesting to have a small application that uh, communicates via Bluetooth and that's what I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes. Uh, looking quickly at the time, okay. So um, yeah, the transport protocols have only a very basic requirement which is uh, they must be message oriented, bi-directional and uh, have reliable transport. Uh, because we don't do any error checking inside the protocol itself. It relies on error checking in the underlying protocols. So, uh, of course, you can easily use a serial interface, but uh, you could get data corruption. So, for the serial protocol, we have a CRC that's part of the serial implementation, but not part of the core thing set protocol. For WebSockets, for example, they are really the ideal transport mechanism, I would say, because they are already have some frames already, so they are message-oriented and, of course, bidirectional. HTTP is not very ideal because you don't easily uh, get the bidirectional communication. Um, yeah, for CAN, uh, the message sizes are really small, at least for classical CAN. Uh, we can only have eight bytes, and uh, that's why we use the ISO TP transport protocol, which can hugely increase the, the number of 
um, bytes you can transfer in one message and then it's also message, pro message oriented at the same time. For uh, Bluetooth, uh, yeah, it, that's a bit a trick of a tricky case. In the Bluetooth Classic, there was a Bluetooth serial um, interface uh, or mm, device uh, specification. Uh, I don't know what the correct term is. For Bluetooth... Profile, profile okay. <laughs> For, uh, thank you. For Bluetooth Low Energy, there is no such uh, profile anymore. And... Uh, of course, Bluetooth already provides very similar things like we have in our structure. Uh, you can uh, create different services and characteristics for um, all your data structure, but it's not as flexible as we wanted it to be. So our Bluetooth protocol is really simple. We have two services, uh, one service and two characteristics, one for sending and one for receiving. And uh, we have a simple packetization mechanism, so it just uh, yeah, it tells you where the end of a packet is and then uh, the other end will realize that it's similar to the SLIP protocol in for serial line communication of IP packets. And with that, yeah, we're kind of abusing the, uh, the Bluetooth a little bit, but I think that's allowed. Uh, you can also use it for uh, with SMS. We actually did that in an application with uh, 2G modem, and you could send basic commands via SMS to the devices with the modem. Uh, for mappings, you can yeah, use other protocols that are not directly compatible, so you can use MQTT for synchronous communication with request response, but you have to uh, come up with the message ID that's encoded inside the topic and things like that. So that's not the ideal use case. So we would say you can map it and, uh, for example, encode the path we are using in ThinkSet into the MQTT topic. That's ideal. Uh, yeah, and you can use it for the desires and reports. We just talked about. LoRaWAN, of course, does not support all the features because it's so uh, low power and low um, yeah, data rate, uh, but it can be uh, integrated very well because it has the concept of ports, and uh, a port is uh, a number from yeah, uh, an 8-bit number, and you can use those for the data object IDs uh, in the binary protocol variant. So that's also quite easily integratable. Uh, and co-op is also quite useful um, because we have similar requests like HTTP and co-op already, so it can be directly mapped. Now, uh, looking at the Zephyr integration, uh, we have quite a few modules that we use. Um, there are two ThingSet related modules. Uh, one is the ThingSet node library and that does all the parsing and uh, basically taking the data from RAM, putting them into the uh, JSON structures and so on. And for that library, we are also using the ZZBOR library from uh, Nordic, which is also part of Zephyr. Um, yeah, and uh, we have developed an, a thing set SDK, um, which uh, integrates all the communication interfaces you need, like the Bluetooth part, uh, the serial part, the CAN bus part. It also integrates with EEPROM and uh, the NVM subs, uh, subsystem so that you can store your values and also use the same protocol or the same data format for all your settings in the device. Um, yeah, and uh, that's part of this uh, SDK, which is also a Zephyr module, and you can j just use that. And uh, yeah, you just need a few lines of code, and then you're almost done. And that's what I'm going to show now. Uh, yeah, so the used features from Zephyr are iterable sections. If you haven't heard about them, that's... Uh, Mm, you can um, specify special structs inside uh, anywhere in your code and the linker picks them up and uh, puts all the structs of the same type in a row into memory. So you basically get an array which you can define uh, anywhere in your code. And we are using that to define all the data items and objects anywhere in the code so you can define them where you need them and then they are all put together into the database, so to say. Then we are using work queues, uh, some peripheral di drivers, as already mentioned, Bluetooth, uh, the shell subsystem, and uh, you can also use uh, ThingSet as a custom logger backend, so you can send the log data out to your cloud if you have that connection already. Okay, for the demo, I'm using a uh, Nordic NRF5 uh, to development kit that you can see here. The original one is here on my desk. Uh, we're using Zephyr uh, version 3.4 with a 
Bosch BME 680 sensor. That's an environmental sensor. It uh, senses uh, temperatures, humidity, pressure, and some air quality value. And uh, we will use uh, ThingSet app, which is also open source, but not yet published in the App Store, but you can download it on our repository, uh, which is written in Flutter. So that's also cross-platform. You can run it on a Linux system, on Windows systems, on iOS, and I'm using Android at the moment. Okay, let's switch to the code. So that uh, you don't see me uh, typing all the time, I prepared some uh, git commits in a row, uh, which I will leverage. Uh, but we start with the simple hello world program. So on the right um, we can see the terminal, I press hello world, I press reset and that's the hello world, so that's our starting point. Now um, let's integrate the sensor. So I will cherry pick this commit and it adds a, a board overlay file uh, with the Bosch BME 680 um, yeah, device tree nodes. And uh, yeah, we were lucky that uh, this sensor was already supported by Zephyr as, as many sensors are. So uh, the programming effort was not too much. Um, everything we have to do here is integrate the, um, yeah, include the, the sensor driver. Uh, then we are specifying uh, two floating point variables, the room temperature and the humidity that are read from the sensor. Um, we get the device tree um, driver, uh, the, the, um, yeah, the device struct uh, pointer. Here, that's all something you probably know, and um, yeah, here we check if the sensor is ready, and in our endless loop, we just sample the sensor and convert the sensor samples into floating point variables, which are specified here, and stop for five seconds and repeat. So let's flash this. Okay, there we go. We have our sensor and it's now just printing to our console, so that's usually the, the first uh, simple test. But now we want to make the data more useful, include the units and use ThingSet instead. So what we are going to do now is, ah, well, the, the next step would actually be uh, we want to have a controller in the end and not just have uh, measurements uh, printed, but we also want to do an action based on the actual measurements. So we implement a really simple control loop, uh, which is here. So we have another function. It's called uh, run controller and it checks if uh, the room temperature is below a target temperature. The target temperature is now hard coded to 22 degrees C. And uh, we also introduce another variable that is heater on, a boolean, and we uh, add an LED. So that's currently our actuator, uh, which is switched on uh, based on the target temperature and the room temperature. Uh, we initialize uh, also the, the GPIO driver, and here at the end we run the controller, and uh, afterwards sleep, nothing else has changed so far. And of course, we had to add all these functions into our project configuration. Uh, I'm using picolibc with the floating points so that we get the floating point print printed out here. We include I squared C and the sensor drivers, and uh, we use lock mode minimal because then uh, with this tiny screen we can easy more easily see the lock messages. So let's flash that, and meanwhile, we can go into the West YAML for a second. Okay, now we see that the, the heater is on, uh, we have another value and I could now test the controller by hard coding uh, that value and changing it, but uh, that wouldn't really make sense. We want to have some interaction with the device. Um, so that's where we are going to introduce ThingSet. And how do we get it into our code base? Uh, it's just this piece of um, change in the West YAML, so we pull in the Zephyr, uh, the things that Zephyr SDK, uh, which itself includes the uh, things that node, which does the parsing uh, module. So we have to put import true, and it will also include C Z Z bore. Um, yeah, so that we have everything we need. 
Now let's go to the next step and enable the thing set SDK and define some objects. Cherry pick this one. Now we have some more changes. Um, first of all, let's look into the project configuration. So now we, we enable the thing set node library, the parsing library, that's this one, and we enable the SDK and we select a node name. So each uh, of the things that nodes, I didn't really cover that yet, uh, has a unique ID and it can have a yeah, more human-friendly node name that's optional. Um, and they have a special name in their structure that's all specified in the specification. Um, yeah, and it can be used to parse uh, the data afterwards. Now uh, we also enable the, con the thing set serial interface, which is uh, one of the subsystems uh, out of the many interfaces we can enable from the SDK, and then it will automatically use the serial interface here. And uh, the exciting part is now happening in our application. So here we in include the thing set .h and the thing set SDK .h, and then we start defining our database, so to say. And it's uh, yeah really quite simple. There are some macros. They are all documented uh, in our uh, on the the website. Uh, if you browse to the code repository, then you get the rendered uh, documentation, and you will see what these parameters mean. So basically, these have this um, iterable section feature behind them, and we have to uh, yeah configure some parameters to build up this tree-like structure, and that's done by uh, numbers, and these numbers are also the uh, numbers used for the binary uh, encoding if you use the ID-based approach for very tiny uh, packages. Um, you would probably in an actual application have a centralized .h file where you um, define your number space. Here I did it just here, and um, yeah, that's also documented which numbers are reserved uh, by the SDK and by the node library. Here we just take some numbers, uh, so this would be the sensor group, and then we have the sub-items, uh, temperature and humidity, and the same for the control group. So we use the things that add group macro. You could place it anywhere in the code, really, so it doesn't matter. It would be picked up automatically by the linker and put in the right place. Then uh, we use the root ID, so that's the parent ID of uh, this uh, data object. Then we use the ID of this object itself. It has to be passed here, then the name, obviously. And uh, this group should not have any callback assigned. We'll come to that later. Uh, then we define two floating point items. Uh, they have one more parameter or two more parameters. Uh, so these are the same. So uh, parent group uh, ID of uh, the this uh, float item itself, then the name with the unit uh, separated with an underscore. And then we have the pointer to the floating point variable in RAM. And here we can define the number of significant digits we want to display, because in uh, JSON you can have infinite number of digits, and uh, if you print floating points, sometimes yeah, you, you have huge number of digits behind the comma you don't really need. So that's specified here. And we can specify some access rights. Um, so this one should be readable by anyone. And these macros are also part of the library which uh, and documented there. And an important aspect here is that this should be part of the subset uh, for live uh, reporting. Yeah, same for all the other items, uh, basically all the same. Um, the only interesting thing is here, which is our stored uh, target temperature. And here we don't have the read only anymore, but we set the write flag as well. So that means this uh, item can be written to by the protocol. Yeah, and uh, now let's flash that. Okay. Now reset. Okay, now we see we can see the reporting in the thing set format. And we could also send requests via the serial interface now, but sending direct requests via serial interface is um, uh, not ideal. So let's take the uh, serial, the um, thing set, uh, the, the shell of Zephyr instead. 
so this is already integrated. The only thing we have to do is uh, replace the serial, uh, what we had activated before, with the things that shell. And in this case, we are disabling the reporting because otherwise it will spam our shell all the time. And so, now, all right, so now we have a log message as well and uh, we can use the thing set protocol. So it's uh, the, it's called thing set, the command here in, this, in the shell. And then we can do this, the question mark, and we get all the data behind the root object. And we can also do control, for example, and get the data behind the control. We can also set values and so on, um, but I'm running out a little, out of time a little bit and want to answer some questions, so I'll go a bit quicker. Um, the next one would be, uh, currently we don't have enabled the storage backend yet, so if we were to store the value or send the write to the stored value, it would not be stored in, in uh, non-volatile memory actually, so we have to enable that. And that's also just a matter of a few lines of uh, kconfig. Uh, what was changed in the main? Ah yeah, we had uh, to add this to the non-volatile memory subset as well, and then it would be stored. And the last part um, would be to add the Bluetooth interface. And that's really just a change in the kconfig. So we enable Bluetooth, um, set the Bluetooth uh, device name, and we increase the package size uh, as much as we can in Bluetooth, and enable things set BLE here. So, yeah, and I'll go to the last, uh, no, I'll check out this one. And uh, so this is also uh, all online already, and you can have a look at it in, into further detail. Now, let's see. Okay, there we go. It uh, puts out some logging information re related to Bluetooth. And um, now I will open my phone and get into this one. So this is a screen copy of my phone and this is the Thingset app, also open source, uh, which can be used to interact with the protocol via Bluetooth now. And we go here and scan for Bluetooth devices. Here we got the Zephyr Developer Summit sensor. Then we click at it and then we can access the device. And now we can compare with our database we just defined. So this is the database and this is the user interface that was completely automatically generated by the um, Bluetooth uh, application and you see um, it takes the units, uh, generates a user interface out of it and now we can even configure the publications here, we can enable and disable them, and we can go into the live screen and see our sensor data. So I can increase the temperature a little bit and then this should also go up. All right, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we have uh, time for one or two questions, I guess. Uh, yeah, Carlos? Thanks for the demo, really cool. And uh, the, uh, in general, everything looks uh, you know, really sound to me. Uh, so inevitable question, why a separate module? Why not upstream this in the main, to the main repo? Well, we could think about that in the future. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, currently, it's, it was still quite a bit in the flow because I almost rewrote the entire library because of some issues uh, and le some legacy issues. But I would be more than happy to upstream it okay. in the future. Just because I think this could, this could fit pretty well into our subsys management folder where we have similar systems where you know you can manage the device sort of you know which in the end it's a data model so i think it could be a good fit of course you know there's uh, details to be but um, why not you know so, yeah yeah okay. yeah for Great. sure yeah it also supports device firmware upgrade and things right. uh, so, so it's it's really easy to just add some items you need uh, and uh, transfer data as you like and so yeah okay thank good. you thanks yeah 
Okay, yeah, um, yeah, I think we have to stop. Can we have one question? Okay, yeah, so uh, just uh, yeah, get in contact with me. Uh, I will be around somewhere here and uh, otherwise there's also my contact details here. Um.